The Hundred Years' War, lasting from 1337 to 1453, is technically the longest war in history, and it's really incredible for many different reasons. Firstly, it's got plenty of super dramatic figures like Bertrand de Guesclin, Joan of Arc, Edward III, the Black Prince, Henry V, or the Blind King of Bohemia, all fighting in an epic war for the future of France and Western Europe in general. Secondly, you saw the Middle Ages die and be replaced by the modern world. The war started with knights fighting over castles in what was clearly in the Middle Ages, but ended with professional armies, gunpowder, and the age of chivalry and the knight clearly thrown into the waste basket. Thirdly, out of this war, you definitively saw England and France, possibly the most important countries in history, come out of the forge of this war as modern countries that would then embark upon changing the rest of the world. So it really begs the question, what if England had won this war? What if proud France had been driven under the English heel? How would that very different world affect history, culture, politics, borders, and wars? That is the question of this alternate history. So the first thing you need to understand at the Hundred Years' War was that it was a horribly unbalanced war, and it's frankly a shocker England got as close to winning as it did. It's kind of similar to the First World War in that aspect, in that both wars were very unbalanced, and they were only very close wars because one side did absolutely everything right, and then that brought the odds much closer. And during this late medieval era, just to show how unbalanced this war was, England had a population of around 3 million, and France of around 17 million. So during this era, England and France were by far the two most powerful and centralized countries in Christendom. However, England was still far more unified than France. France was at best a loose confederacy, and the great noble houses like the Dukes of Orléans and Anjou basically managed their own lands how they pleased, and paid almost no taxes to the French government, just giving the French king homage and troops. Well, meanwhile, the Dukes of Brittany were basically kings in their own right. England was not built like that, with every Englishman pledging loyalty to the king above his local liege lord, and with all lands in England being owned by the king and thus confiscatable by the king. For this reason, it meant that even though France had around five times England's population, the kings of England and the kings of France had roughly the same income. At the same time, similarly to the Kaiser's Germany in World War I, the English military did everything right. It's sort of a rule that if it was a smart idea in late medieval warfare, the medieval English probably did it. The English implemented conscription, the famous practically machine gun longbows, cannons, using knights as defensive infantry, purposely raiding to destroy the French economy, and they were easily one of the most disciplined militaries in Europe at the time. This actually worked very well. In 1428, the English were in control of the top third of France, including Paris, as well as most of the Atlantic coast of the country. The rest of France was loosely held on by the Dauphin, or Prince, who was a spineless fool that for all practical purposes wasn't even fighting the English, and was a prisoner of the House of Orléans, and let the great nobles run their estates unhindered. The English were steadily pushing south since there was no real resistance. This is where Joan of Arc comes in. We all know of her, how a peasant girl heard the voice of God and then liberated France. That is true, but it ignores a great deal of background information. Joan knew nothing about military tactics and wasn't a mighty warrior. What she was perfect at was inspiring the people of France, who had lost hope and had frankly stopped caring. France, if mobilized, still seriously outnumbered the English, and Joan made the French think God was on their side, and thus she turned the tide of the war. A theory that makes a lot of sense to me is that she was a pawn of the Duc d'Alençon, who protected her in the quite toxic French royal court and was actually a good strategist that was always by her side. I mean, if I was a powerful French nobleman in this era, and I understood the strategic situation, I would have given an arm and a leg for a card like Joan of Arc that I could play to mobilize France. So in this timeline, that never happens. Joan of Arc dies of the plague when she's even more of a child, and never turns the tide of the war. The English besiege the Loire Valley, 
and the Dauphin flees to Toulouse. The French nobility, unable to stand how lame their monarch is, switch over to the English side and then the English gain control of France. This would have a strange series of effects on both countries. Firstly, the conquest of France, significantly larger country than England, would require the full energies of the English monarchy. The English court would likely move to Paris full-time to control their new conquests. Every time a smaller country takes over a larger one, this happens. When the Scottish Stuarts got the English crown, they moved their capital to London. When the nomadic tribes conquered China, they put their capital in or close to Beijing. When Alexander conquered the Persian Empire, he put his capital at Babylon. I mean, if the Canadians hypothetically took over America, could you imagine them keeping the capital in Ottawa, a city most of their subjects would never have heard of? So the English would have gained control over France by telling the great nobility that they'd be able to keep the same rights as they did under the French crown. But quickly, the English monarchy would be driven insane by the decentralization of France, and so would try to make France more into the centralized English model. And they would do this by doing the classic medieval king move and allying with the church and the towns against the nobility. And in this era, France had the equivalent of around five different regional parliaments for different parts of France. They communicated directly with the king. And the English likely replaced this with a single parliament in Paris based off the English model. And in our world, after the Hundred Years' War, France became probably the most centralized nation in Europe, but they did it in a very French model, by which the crown was the main force, and had a massive bureaucracy going to each part of France to control it in the crown's name. And that would not happen in this world. As the English monarchy would move to the continent, the parliament would run England proper more and more, and thus the English people would identify over time more with their parliament than with their king. And the English people would begrudge the decades-long migration of money and men to subdue the continent, but likely not enough to rebel, since they'd also be reaping many rewards from the conquest of the continent. The Hundred Years' War created England and France in many different ways. Before the war, most of the English nobility spoke French and owned lands in both England and France. And earlier in the Middle Ages, there were many points in which the King of England owned more of France than the King of France. But by the end of the war, Basically, most Englishmen thought of themselves as Englishmen, and most Frenchmen thought of themselves as Frenchmen. And in our world, the war's ending solidified these national identities by making these clean borders, but in this world, it would be far more complicated. Actually, as the war was being fought in our world, the English were moving settlers in to the north of France, in areas like Normandy and Maine. And I know this is not the professional historian thing to do, but I can't help but think of these guys as beta Americans, and everything I've read points me to that. They took great pride in owning their own land and not being subjugated to foreign lords, and when the English gave up those areas and fled, they actually made their own militias to fight off the French military, and basically made Minutemen longbow formations, and actually gave the French a pretty bloody nose before being defeated. Meanwhile, as more and more English would migrate into the north of France, the English court would become more and more French. In every example I gave earlier of a smaller country conquering a larger one, the culture of the larger country eventually assimilated the courts of the smaller country. And that's what would happen in this world. As a student of medieval civilization, I frankly get the impression French medieval culture was nicer than England's. The English nobility imported mountains of wine from France, Recipes were constantly going across the channel to England, and France exported artisans of all kinds. And in this world, we would see a bizarre combination of the Anglicization of parts of France and at the same time the Gallicization of the English court. One of the reasons the Hundred Years' War lasted so long was that the English nobility had made an implicit social contract in which a war with France was the fuel. The English nobility didn't rebel because the King of England could supply them with permanent war, booty, and the promise of land. Meanwhile, the English lower classes had the opportunity to steal some stuff and get away from how much their lives sucked. And after over a hundred years of war, and the English nobility realizing that they weren't going to get any land in France, they're like, no, -uh, you promised! And that's how the Wars of the Roses started. And that meant that England fell into 30 years of civil war after the French defeated them. None of this would happen in this timeline. The English nobility would be content with gaining their titles, and so the Plantagenets remain on the Anglo-French throne. This completely derails 500 years of English history. And you would never see monarchs like Elizabeth, Henry VIII, George III, or Victoria. 
basically the whole direction of English history and leadership as we saw it in our world would be gone. The Burgundians got a sweet deal out of the Hundred Years' War. Why don't we call them Francis, Texas? And they got to use the war between the English and the French to get independence and take over a sweet chunk of land between the North Sea and the Alps, or between France and Germany. In our world, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, lost a series of embarrassing defeats against the Swiss and died, and upon his death, the French carved up his kingdom with the German Empire. England's now occupying the same geographic and strategic position as France would likely do exact same thing. The English would also likely scoop up Flanders in the north, their biggest trading partner, and considering their control of both sides of the English Channel, it would not be a difficult conquest. Scotland would likely remain independent. Wars in this era were fought primarily for money, and Scotland was not wealthy enough to justify the decades-long military campaign necessary to subjugate the Scottish Highlands. The English likely be drawn into the continent and spend most of their energies around their French domain. Given the choice between attacking Strasbourg, Antwerp, and Edinburgh, they'd pick the first two. England-France would easily be the most powerful nation in Europe for a few decades until the Spanish and Holy Roman or German empires would join under the Habsburgs. As long as the Habsburgs would control both Spain and Central Europe, or until around 1650, they would be the primary rivals of the Anglo-French monarchy. The whole Columbus thing is impossible to predict. Columbus didn't care what government he worked for, as long as they paid to have his expedition to the Indies. In our world, he actually asked the English and the French crowns to outfit his expedition before the Spanish, and a big reason that the English turned him down was because they were in an isolationist hangover after losing the Hundred Years' War. And so it's impossible to say who would discover the new world first in this world. And frankly, it doesn't matter, because it's practically destiny that both the Habsburgs and the Plantagenets would both have colonies in the new world and compete with each other. The Anglo-French monarchy would likely convert to Protestantism. Basically, every Germanic country that wasn't ruled by the ultra-Catholic Habsburgs did. And it really makes you wonder that the regions of France that went for Protestantism in our world were very closely aligned with the regions that the English held on to the longest. As well, some of England's biggest trading partners were Flanders and Norway, also Protestant regions. And at the same time, their greatest rivals would be the ultra-Catholic Habsburgs. And so, in this world, both England and France would likely be united by some form of Calvinism, likely not far from our world's Presbyterianism. The Dutch rebellions would likely never happen in this world, and if they did, they'd likely be much more subtle. The wars were fought for mostly religious reasons, and it's hard to imagine the Spanish controlling modern-day Netherlands with the English in control of modern-day Belgium. And even if they did, then the war would be a walkover for the Dutch with English support and without the Spanish in control of Flanders or much of modern-day Belgium. Actually, not having to fight this war might make Spain more powerful, as the 80 years of trying to reconquer the Netherlands from the Dutch rebels basically bankrupted the Spanish monarchy, and it was ruinously expensive. And actually, in 17th century Europe, the phrase, to put a pikeman in Flanders, was a truism to describe doing something nearly impossible. And without such an extensive and expensive war, with the Spanish Armada being one facet of it, runaway inflation would likely have not destroyed the Spanish economy, and this might have actually resulted in more stable economic institutions in Spain, which would have done Latin America quite a bit of good. The whole situation in the New World is very difficult to predict. Since we don't know who discovers the continent, we don't really know who colonizes anywhere. It wouldn't surprise me at all in this world if the English colonized the Aztec Empire and found Mexico, while at the same time the Inca Empire remains independent. And this sort of thing matters a great deal because the English were much better society builders than the Spanish, and English colonies in general did much better than Spanish ones. And so this decision basically affects whether the United Nations in this world is based out of New York or Veracruz. In alternate history in general, you run into severe issues with the founding of civilizations and societies. For example, if you change a slight detail in Dark Age Europe, you can get rid of France forever and replace it with something you have no idea about, because France doesn't exist at this point. The Frankish tribes do. And this is very true of the United States. Take this man, William Barclay. He basically single-handedly made the American South. As governor of Virginia during a very important 17-year stretch in the 17th century, he basically established the southern class, agricultural, slave, and political systems that would last for hundreds of years. 
The United States, as we understand today, is the creation of all sorts of tiny minutia in 17th century England that would almost certainly be different in this world. Even random shit as obscure as Cromwell's policy of tolerance to the Quaker has probably determined whether America was a united country or not. There would likely still be English colonies in this world, in the New World, I just have no idea what they'd be like. We also run into issues with England's development in general, in that part of the reason the Anglo-Saxon nations were so successful was that Charles I was such a reckless dick that he got the mercantile classes to rebel against him, and this resulted in England becoming a parliamentary run nation. Since the mercantile classes were in charge, they basically supported property rights and economic growth, while basically everyone else in Europe was trying to get involved in dumb wars for regional conquest, and this resulted in England turning into an economic and demographic juggernaut that took over much of the world. However, this whole string of events is predicated upon the ruling class being enormous dicks and losing their civil war. And in this world in which we have no idea who's running England, it's practically impossible to know what direction England would take in this world. So I'm sorry I've succumbed to vagueness in general, but there are a few things I can predict. The Thirty Years' War likely still break out for similar geopolitical reasons, with the Franco-English nation being the main player against the Habsburgs. This would make the Habsburg alliance weaker than our world, which would be great for the Swedes, the new European player who would likely get Brandenburg in the northwest of Germany. This would in turn crush the Prussians in their infancy, who if you don't know were the people who used military genius to unite Germany in our world, and the world wars were basically fought to keep Prussian Germany from conquering all Europe. So yeah, things would change. It would not at all surprise me if the Swedes would be able to consolidate control over Scandinavia, and maybe form an alliance of the North German states over a century or two. And then we run into serious questions about Russia, so I should probably slow this down. Another effect of the Thirty Years' War would be that Bohemia would become an independent Protestant nation in Central Europe. In our world, the Austrians drained Bohemia in the 17th and 18th centuries, bringing its wealth to help grow Austria. But in this world, Bohemia would remain a powerful and wealthy player in Central Europe. So this timeline falls into a giant question mark after a bit, but there are a few things I can predict far further into the future. Firstly, that there'd be far more Frenchmen in the New World. The English government with its parliamentary system encouraged the migration of dissident groups to the colonies to get rid of them. Meanwhile, the Catholic nations prevented this, not wanting their colonies to become polluted by all these dissident groups. Also, subject populations tend to migrate to the colonies in far greater number than the dominant ones, which is why there are so many different people of Scottish and Irish ancestry in the US and in other Anglo colonies, and why so many Basques and people of Arab and Jewish descent migrated to the Spanish colonies in our timeline. It wouldn't at all surprise me in this world if French dissident sects, whether Catholic or Protestant, would migrate to the New World under the English crown, founding French-speaking colonies. In our world, the British were able to invest in their navy as an island nation and not get involved in continental wars. This let them dominate the colony game, scooping up colonies from countries that were busy fighting in European wars. However, with England deeply involved in continental politics, this would mean they wouldn't have this luxury. This would give openings for other European colonial powers, the most likely of which I think would be the Swedes. France being a parliamentary nation would result in the growth of stability in the rule of law, rather than the bureaucratic absolutism that took place in our world. And also the Protestants' insistence upon literacy that comes from the belief that everyone should read the Bible means that basically every Protestant nation is wealthy and industrialized. And this would mean in this world, France would likely be one of the most industrialized nations in the world. In our world, for almost all of history, France was the wealthiest and most populous nation in Europe. But with the Industrial Revolution, England and Germany pulled ahead. But this would never happen in this world, and so France would remain the most populous and powerful nation this side of Russia. Before we Anglo-Saxons keep circle-jerking ourselves, let's remember that even though the Bourbon centralized monarchy slowed down France's intellectual and economic growth, it gave us lots of really nice things that we'd have to give up in this world. 
Like French cuisine as we understand it, which is the origin of much of our modern Western philosophy of cooking, as well as the origin of most modern fashion, much of the modern novel, as well as the metric system. All the centralized wealth in the French court system of the Bourbon monarchy resulted in a cultural flowering that's very hard to rival throughout history and wouldn't be in this world. I frankly don't see England and France remaining under the same government past, say, 1700 with a standard deviation of 100 years because both countries would have their own parallel administrative structures inside their own languages, as well as their own colonies. And geography would also be playing against them with having a channel between the two. But that doesn't mean it has to be a bad breakup. Neither side would have much bad blood with the other, with the English managing themselves for the most part and the French court turning the English crown into one of them. And I could easily see both countries, united by common religion and centuries of union, remaining allies afterwards and after their governments had split up. Here I am doing what I always do, inspecting the quality of my blade in front of a giant pile of books. And you know, it's awfully rude to be disrespectful to a person who is heavily armed right in front of you. And so I think it would be inside your strategic self-interest to subscribe now and to give me money on Patreon while telling all your friends about What If I'll Test. And thank you so much for watching this video, and have a good day.